Hello, hello everyone. Welcome to another Planetarium live stream. I'm uh, getting things all set up again, so while everybody is joining us, uh, hello, hello. Feel free to comment and let us know where you're watching from. Uh, and uh, if you have any questions or anything like that, uh, let me know. All right, looks like we are live. Awesome, awesome. Uh, let me get back over to my notes. Uh, we're doing these monthly, so it takes me a minute to get back in the groove. Um, but uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, for those of you tuning in and still tuning in, I'll introduce myself. My name is Patrick Hess. I'm the Planetarium Manager at Union Station. And I'm so excited to have you here with us tonight for this live stream, uh, this uh, What's Up show. We are going to go over uh, all of the exciting space news that's happened over the past month, uh, as well as a little star tour at the end, so I can show you what's up in the next month in our night skies here as we wrap up summer 2020. Can you believe it? It's over halfway through with this year, although it feels like it's been 10 years. Um, I want to definitely thank our uh, supporting sponsor, MRI Global, for keeping these live streams going and for supporting many of the other programs at Union Station. Uh, and of course, thank you to our longtime viewers and uh, our first time watchers as well. If you're tuning in for the first time, welcome. We're so happy to have you here. As a reminder, this is a live stream. So if you have any questions or comments, if you want to give a shout out to anybody, uh, or if you want to let us know where you're watching from, I always love seeing where everybody's watching from. So please chime in. And if you're a longtime watcher, thanks for sticking with us for so long. This is our 73rd live stream over the past year plus. Uh, so, so, so happy you all have stuck with us this long. Uh, and if you are a new watcher, uh, then I want to let you know uh, and uh, remind our old watchers as well uh, that our live streams are available on our YouTube channel, uh, youtube.com slash KC Planetarium, where you can find all our past streams, uh, uploads of our uh, What's Up Star Tours as well. Uh, and I've got some convenient playlists where you can uh, check out our live streams categorized like our solar system tour, our science fiction deep dives. Uh, we've done a bunch of different uh, live streams live streams about sky cultures and stories from mythology from around the world. Uh, and of course, uh, all uh, almost 50 of our deep dive topics. Pretty incredible. We covered so much. So thank you all so much uh, for supporting us. Uh, so, uh, oh, and a big exciting announcement you may have seen uh, posted. Uh, well, I think we posted on our uh, Facebook page. I know I posted it on my Facebook page. Sometimes I get uh, everything all mixed up. But uh, if you didn't know, we did cross a milestone over the past month. We hit 300,000 views. Uh, that's right. Uh, over all of the 72 live streams we've done so far, um, we have now amassed over 300,000 views. Pretty incredible. Here's a, you can see behind the scenes a little bit. Here's a nifty little chart showing the view trajectory. As we started out uh, during the lockdowns of the pandemic, we were uh, going three times a week, which was super fun uh, and a lot of work. And then we switched to weekly live streams and our deep dives throughout the year. And then starting this uh, March, uh, we went to our monthly streams. So again, all those past streams can be found uh, on our YouTube channel. Uh, and uh, yeah, excited uh, to have you all uh, check out uh, all of those past streams. Uh, if you are a longtime watcher, let us know what your favorite stream is uh, from the past. Uh, and uh, we may cover topics like that in the future as well. Uh, already getting some shout outs and comments. If you've just tuned in, don't forget this is a live stream. So let us know where you're watching from. Uh, give uh, me a shout out, say hello. And if you have any questions throughout the stream about anything we talk about or anything else in general, I give great life advice. Uh, then please post those in the comments. We've got Sherry uh, watching from Grove, Oklahoma. Awesome, Sherry. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, Jenny is watching from Deepwater, Missouri. Thanks for watching, Jenny. We got Brenda. Brenda says, I'm about to turn 60. Does that count as an old watcher? Brenda, uh, I don't know about old, but uh, congratulations on the upcoming birthday. Very exciting. Uh, Kelly says hi in Kansas City. Uh, and Jax also says hello. Jax, thanks so much for watching. Jax, I want you to think of a really good space or astronomy or just science question and ask it before the end of the tour because, or stream because I would love to answer that for you. We've got RY saying, hey, from Kansas with a couple Kansas-themed emojis. Love the sunflowers. Awesome. I'm a Kansas boy myself and grew up uh, over on the Kansas side. Uh, and then Christina is watching from Platte City, Missouri. Thanks, Christina, Christina, for tuning in. 
As a reminder, a couple other little housekeeping tidbits. The planetarium is open. So the Gottlieb Planetarium at Union Station is open to the public. Um, as a reminder, uh, for those of you uh, who don't know or don't live in the city limits, there is a brand new city ordinance uh, that the mayor of Kansas City just enacted. Uh, this will be through August 28th. Um, masks are now required indoors again. Again, the mayor's office uh, announced this ordinance. Uh, so Union Station is following the orders from the mayor. Uh, so um, please plan your visit accordingly. Again, this is uh, according to the mayor's orders. We don't have control over that. Um, but we'd love to see you. Uh, and we have a smattering of amazing laser shows going on right now. We have a laser summer uh, going on with a bunch of new shows. So if you're uh, a person who's been to the planetarium years ago and hasn't been since, a bunch of brand new shows. We've got Peter and the Wolf for our younger audiences. That's a symphonic fairy tale. And then a couple exciting science shows like Laser Space Chase and A Brief Mystery of Time, as well as some concerts going on like The Beatles and Queen and Michael Jackson and Daft Punk every week. Um, so check those out. Uh, and and uh, just as a little bit of uh, information, let me... Um, Move myself wee over here. Um, but uh, as you can see, um, a little yellow note in the corner, um, our Star Tours and other fan favorite documentary and kids shows like Big Bird's Adventure and Magic Treehouse are going to be returning in September. Uh, so we have uh, been uh, just showing laser shows this summer as we're uh, undergoing some hardware upgrades on our projection system. But in September, we'll be bringing in brand new fancy projectors uh, and we will be... Uh, back to our uh, fan favorite shows. Um, ooh, and, ooh, I'm moving myself around here. <laughs> All right. Uh, oh. Um, uh, okay, I'm going to spend too much time trying to line myself up. All right. That's uh, close enough, I believe. Uh, All right. Ooh, there we go. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> So like I said, we're doing laser shows this summer um, uh, and uh, tickets are $8 uh, per, per uh, person who is three years and old and older and then $4 for Union Station members. As a reminder, Union Station members also get free passes you can use each year. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, we'd love to see you. And then again in September, our regular shows are coming back. We have more laser shows as well. Uh, this weekend on Friday and Saturday night, uh, August's monthly laser show theme is Girl Power. So we've got an awesome Girl Power mixtape uh, featuring Lady Gaga, Beyonce, Lizzo, uh, and others like Pink, Aretha Franklin, Madonna, No Doubt, and a lot more. And then we have special uh, hour-long showings all about Lady Gaga, Beyonce, and Lizzo featuring their music set to spectacular laser lights. Those tickets are $8 as well. And again, Friday and Saturday night, this weekend only for these Laser Girl Power shows. Tickets available now. Definitely check those out. All right. Um, wrapping up our housekeeping. Uh, one more thing, folks. Tonight at 8.30... I'm going to be heading over to the Liberty Memorial at the World War I Museum. That's across the street from Union Station in downtown Kansas City. I'm going to be setting my telescope up again tonight at 8.30 uh, because today or last night specifically was the opposition of Saturn. So that's when Saturn gets closest to the Earth in its orbit. And that means that this week is the best time to view the ringed planet. I'll be setting up my telescope and we're going to be seeing close-up views of Saturn, including its rings. Uh, so I'd love for you to come join me. We posted on our Facebook page earlier and I'll remind you at the end of this stream. But again, tonight at 8.30 around sunset, I'll be setting up my telescope downtown. So if you'd like to see some telescope views, that is a free event uh, and it, it is outdoors. So masks, masks are optional. I'd encourage you to wear a mask if you are unvaccinated. Um, but uh, yeah, I'd love for you to join me to see Saturn through the telescope. Uh, and uh, now we are going to be jumping into our uh, news update over the past month. And again, at the end of that news update, we'll be doing our What's Up stream uh, talking about our night sky, stars and constellations you'll see this season. But jumping over to the comments, let's see what people are saying. Remember, this is a live stream. If you've tuned in late, uh, please ask uh, any questions you have or just give us a shout out. Let us know where you're watching from. David Sutton, one of our longtime viewers, says, I love the sci-fi related streams. How is your reading of the three-body problem? David, I should have known you were going to ask about that. Uh, well, I have finished the three-body problem and its sequel, The Dark Forest, and I am currently in the middle of Death's End, the third book in that series. And no spoilers for our watchers, but man, mind-blowing, and I can't wait to talk about it. In fact, I'm probably just going to have to do a bonus stream at some point because I'm obsessed with this book series. Uh, it's like changing my life. So, David, uh, yeah, don't spoil the ending of the third book for me, but so far... Man, it's crazy. Um, uh, very, very excited to see where the story goes because it's gone in some crazy directions. So thanks for asking that, David. Uh, Melinda says, uh, Melinda was asking how much tickets are and what are the hours. So um, our uh, planetarium shows 
Uh, you can find our full schedule online. Uh, just go to uh, unionstation.org uh, and you can look that up. Uh, although often it's easier to see our breakdown of the schedule, the hourly shows um, on our Facebook page. So go to facebook.com slash KC Planetarium, uh, where we often post our schedules. And that's kind of the easiest way to just see it all in one place. Uh, Eric, one of our longtime watchers, is saying howdy, uh, watching from, uh, I, I don't know, it doesn't say, but probably somewhere in uh, Shawnee, I'm guessing. And then Nikki says, I love the laser light shows, but they're a bit much for my kids. Does the planetarium have plans for non-laser light shows events, uh, like a thing on the screen to learn about space and planets? Nikki, thanks so much for asking that. Um, and uh, first of all, we do have a couple kids laser shows that are about planets and stars. The Great Space Chase features a solar system tour, for example. Uh, but don't worry, I mentioned a bit earlier, but you may have tuned in a little bit recently. Um, but our Star Tours and other regular space-related shows, including our kids' shows like Big Bird's Adventure and Magic Treehouse and other fan favorites, um, are going to be returning in September. We're installing new projectors at that time, upgrading our hardware. So stay tuned and be sure to subscribe to our Facebook page, uh, facebook.com slash Planetarium, for all the updates about that, Nikki. But thanks so much for asking that. Uh, and without further ado, we are going to jump into the news. So let's get right started. So uh, first of all, the best and most exciting news, Hubble is back. If you've been following along, we did mention on last month's stream that there have been some technical difficulties um, with uh, the Hubble Space Telescope for a little over a month. Um, but uh, in the middle of last month, on July 15th, uh, the team that monitors Hubble switched the spacecraft over to backup hardware. And a couple days later, uh, NASA resumed uh, their uh, science operations and deep space observations. Uh, so and NASA anticipates that Hubble's going to last for many more years and will continue making groundbreaking observations, working in tandem with other space observatories, including the James Webb Space Telescope, currently slated to launch this October uh, and to further our knowledge of the cosmos. So this is on NASA's website announcing that Hubble has returned to operation. So very exciting for Hubble. Just wanted to post that exciting and good news right off the bat. Um, another news update that we have been following along, I mentioned last time that uh, a couple of billionaires went to space. I put space in big quotes. Uh, so Richard Branson, who uh, leads Virgin Galactic, as well as Jeff Bezos, who's in charge of Amazon, uh, they both successfully took off and traveled above the Earth's atmosphere on their respective company's rockets. Um, so Richard Branson flew on July 11th, and Jeff Bezos, not to be outdone by his billionaire brethren, uh, went to space nine days later on the 20th of July. Uh, so neither of them went to orbit. They did go to space, technically, although the borders between Earth uh, Earth's atmosphere and space are kind of fuzzy. Uh, so, you know, um, I, I will say that many of the national governments around the world announced that neither are going to be considered astronauts, uh, just like how passengers on a cruise ship would not be considered sailors. Uh, so astronaut, uh, that title is reserved for uh, a different class of people who uh, have trained to go to space and specifically who pilot the spacecraft or do science in space. I did want to mention, though, that uh, the real story here was about Wally Funk. Uh, Wally Funk uh, became the oldest person to go into space at the age of 82. Uh, Wally flew aboard Jeff Bezos's rocket. Um, and uh, this was exciting because Wally was one of a dozen women uh, who have been, uh, who have uh, at this point have been come to, have been known, I have come to have been known, is that the right grammar? <laughs> as the Mercury 13, uh, which is in contrast to NASA's original astronauts known as the Mercury 7. Uh, so Funk, uh, as well as others, were skilled pilots who, like their male, count male counterparts, dreamed of flying even higher uh, to go to space. But they were never included in NASA's vision of spaceflight and never officially became astronauts. They were part. Uh, they were not officially part of NASA at all, actually. They were part of a privately funded program uh, that was started to compare women and men during the astronaut training process. Uh, Wally, along with others, did lobby Congress in 1962 to include women as astronauts, but it wasn't until 1978 uh, that uh, NASA began recruiting women for spaceflight. Uh, by the way, just as a sidebar, uh, Russian cosmonaut Valentina Tereshkova was the first, or was the 12th person and first woman to go to space in 1963. And the first American female astronaut uh, named Sally Ride went to space 20 years later. So great job, NASA, on that one. Way to really uh, uh, procrastinate on that. All right, checking in to the com. Oh, no new comments. All right, no worries. Don't forget this is a live stream. If you have any questions, feel free to 
shout those out. Uh, but let's uh, continue on with the news. Uh, just real quick, there is a rocket launch scheduled whoops, for tomorrow. Uh, this is the Boeing Starliner, which has been delayed quite a few times. This is an orbital test flight uh, uncrewed uh, that will be going to the space station, hopefully. The last test was in December 2019, but there were a bunch of glitches, glitches that uh, made the capsule unable to reach uh, uh, the ISS, but tomorrow, uh, at least the last time I checked yesterday, um, <laughs> this was this is scheduled to launch tomorrow. So hopefully, uh, this uh, will get to space. Um, this would be uh, important because uh, the Boeing Starliner would be another uh, private spacecraft that could take American astronauts or any astronauts for that matter to the space station. This is in addition to SpaceX's Dragon capsule. Uh, so hopefully that launch goes well. We can post updates on our Facebook page. Here's a funny, uh, fluffy story. NASA is now growing uh, chili peppers uh, aboard the space station. Things are heating up aboard the ISS. So in a few months, fully grown red and green chili peppers should be tempting the taste buds of astronauts on the International Space Station. Uh, now, this is one of the most complex plant experiments on the station to date because of how long the germination process is for peppers. So it's not just for spicing up food, it is for science. Uh, so uh, pretty exciting there. Kind of fun that NASA uh, astronauts get to grow their own food up there. They will eat these peppers in addition to sending a couple back down to Earth to test. Um, another ISS update. Uh, which was a bit of a harrowing update. Uh, first of all, the Nauka module uh, connected to the ISS. This module was originally planned to launch in 2007, but it was repeatedly delayed. This is a Russian module. It was finally launched on July 21st, uh, and it uh, docked later on, a few dozen hours later. About three hours after the Nauka module docked to the ISS, astronauts notice uh, the International Space Station um, rotating uh, unexpectedly, which is not great uh, when you are aboard a space station. Oop, ignore that. Uh, alien xenomorph. Um, so uh, here is NASA's tweet about this. Um, so essentially what happened is there was a software glitch and the module thought that it was still floating in space and not attached to the space station, so its thrusters were still firing, which started spinning the space station around. Um, luckily, uh, the astronauts were uh, never in any real danger and US and Russian officials were able to fix the glitch uh, and use thrusters on other modules to correct the ISS's uh, orientation. Um, so uh, yep, so things are good, but uh, be careful when you're sending modules to the space station because uh, you don't want them to uh, mess up because there are a lot of other modules connected to them. Uh, by the way, if you want to learn more about the International Space Station, I did a live stream where I built a Lego model of the International Space Station. Uh, that was a live stream on uh, October 20th of last year. Again, you can find all of our past live streams on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Planetarium. All right. Hopefully people are still watching. I have no way of knowing. I could be just talking into a black void. If you're still watching, let us know. Uh, just give us a shout out in the comments. Tell us where you're watching from. If you have any questions, please feel free to throw those out. We're going to go over a couple of more space news updates before we begin our star tour. Uh, and here is an exciting update. We've been following along with the Ingenuity uh, helicopter, the helicopter that hitched a ride aboard the Perseverance rover to the red planet Mars. Uh, and just the other day, uh, Ingenuity completed its 10th test flight on the Red Planet. In fact, over the past month, it completed 9 and 10 flights. Um, it was originally only designed for four flights as sort of a proof of concept, but excitingly, uh, the mission was extremely successful, so they have extended that mission. Now, the flights have become more and more daring. Here is a 3D simulation somebody put together of the ninth test flight, so you can kind of see how complicated its flight was and how far it's traveling. In fact, uh, the Ingenuity helicopter reached a new milestone. It actually, um, let me full screen this so I can get a good thumbnail shot. Um, so Ingenuity actually uh, has now traveled over one mile on the Martian surface. So big, big uh, momentous uh, accomplishment uh, for that. I mean, look how, look at this thing. It's flying on Mars. That's crazy, right? Pretty, pretty cool, pretty cool. Um, so anyway, exciting updates about Ingenuity. Uh, by the way, if you want to learn more about the Perseverance rover's uh, missions, you can go to uh, mars.nasa.gov slash mars2020. This is a great website with uh, an overview about the Perseverance rover and information about Ingenuity. And NASA's got a ton of great resources, which we will talk about in more uh, detail. Um, let's see. Ba -do -ba -do -ba -do. Um, speaking of Mars, there's another robot that's been on Mars for almost a decade. Uh, it's Perseverance's older sister, Curiosity. 
Uh, and Curiosity, the rover, to, uh, the Curiosity rover, just made an exciting discovery. So here is a official journal article. I don't say I never use sources. Uh, that's to my college professors. Um, but uh, this is uh, pretty exciting. So uh, the article says brine driven destruction destruction of clay minerals in Gale Crater Mars, which sounds kind of weird, but essentially what this article is announcing is that Curiosity has found uh, that there is evidence of a lot of really salty water uh, in the crater that it's been exploring for the past nine years. Uh, and uh, this is interesting because they've uh, found that this salty water has likely eroded uh, a lot of sedimentary rocks that it has been exploring, um, which uh, could mean that um, that uh, there could be uh, there could be evidence of life that has actually been stripped away from uh, from this super salty water. Uh, so it's it's in this ancient lake bed, uh, Curiosity, and so it's exploring ancient clay basically. Uh, but this super salty water would have stripped away layers of this clay over uh, millennia and uh, th billions of years. Um, so uh, this is good and bad news. Like I said, it could uh, it could make the um, search for life uh, a little bit harder for Curiosity, but this helps inform Perseverance's search because now we know uh, to look for uh, these these signs that uh, this these layers of clay have been stripped away. There are many other areas of this crater that the clay has not been stripped away, so it only seems it seems kind of patchy, um, which is uh, pretty good. All right, let's direct our gaze a little bit farther outwards. Uh, and uh, exciting for amateur astronomers out there. An amateur astronomer just made a super important and exciting discovery. They discovered the 80th moon of Jupiter. Um, so this amateur astronomer uh, has been, uh, actually has found a lot of moons of Jupiter. Um, uh, the, this, uh, this particular astronomer recovered four lost Jovian moons that had been, well, lost uh, for a while. Um, uh, their name is uh, Kai Lai. Uh, and then uh, they uh, reported this discovery uh, on June 30th and submitted it for publication on the Minor Planet Electronic Circular, which is a, a minor planet themed message board. There is something for everybody on the Internet, isn't there? Um, so it hasn't received official designation yet, uh, but if it is confirmed uh, by the International Astronomical Union, this will become the 80th moon of Jupiter, which is still not the most moons because Saturn has 82 confirmed moons. And remember, we're going to be looking at Saturn tonight at 8.30 at the Liberty Memorial. I'm going to set my telescope up. Uh, so if you want to join me there, uh, out back, it'll be uh, on the south side on the observation deck. Uh, we're going to look at uh, Saturn through my telescope and Jupiter will be up as well. Maybe we'll see some views of Jupiter. All right. I'm going to skip over a little bit. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Skip that story. Yeah, no, let's, um, you know what? I, I let's talk about this story. Why not? There's a lot of there's a lot of good stuff. Oh, but first, actually, let's uh, go over to the comments. We've got some people chiming in. Thanks for commenting, everybody. Will says, "I was wondering if the peppers will still have the kick. Gravity, heat, environment, etc., etc., are all vital to a heat of a pepper. Will be interesting to follow." It's a great question, Will. I mean, the scientific answer is we don't really know. Um, if I had to guess, I would say they would probably taste pretty similar, since that capsaicin is stored in the, the seeds of the peppers, I believe. Um, but I could be wrong about that. That's a great question, Will. Definitely will follow along with that story. Uh, David says, when the ISS grows food like peppers, what happens to the non-edible plant waste products, stem, leaves, and roots? Are these composted or sent back to Earth? David, that's a really awesome question. Um, uh, let's find out right now. Uh, so uh, can you compost in space? Look at that. Uh, NASA just has a website for everything. This is a is a, a bit older, uh, so 2004, but uh, this is aboard the International Space Station, I assume. Um, so let's see. Uh, doop, doop, doop. So on the International Space Station, solid waste is stored in bags and containers until a Russian progress module arrives, uh, and then they take the trash back to Earth. Um, so it looks like... Ah, so, so it looks like, David, a composting uh, uses vital oxygen, uh, and that's... Um, that would be really wasteful aboard the International Space Station. So it seems like uh, they uh, probably don't compost, although this is an older story, so maybe they do now. Um, but uh, microbes need oxygen to do their de decomposition work. But oxygen should be spent on the crew instead of waste. But David, that's an awesome question. And you know what? I learned something new too. I love it when somebody asks a great question and I learned something new. Uh, Patience, one of our longtime watchers, is chiming in. Patience, great to see you. Thanks for tuning in tonight. Patience says, that Lego model was so cool. I'm glad you remember that stream. That was a fun one as well. Uh, and Lauren is watching from Alabama uh, with Boo and Chaos, uh, which I'm going to guess are a pair of cats. Uh, well, Lauren, give Boo and Chaos a scratch behind the ears for me. Thanks for tuning in. All right. Uh, so uh, let's uh, check out this news story. 
Um, so based on some old data from the Hubble Space Telescope, a 20 year old data, in fact, NASA has recently discovered uh, that Ganymede, which is the largest moon in the solar system, uh, one of the Jupiter's moons, um, we have confirmed, or we're not confirmed, I guess, there's evidence that suggests water vapor is present in the atmosphere of Ganymede. Um, so over the course of a day on Ganymede, the surface temperature rises and falls as the sunlight hits it. And then around noon on this moon, uh, the surface could get warm enough to release water molecules, so water vapor. Uh, so the findings uh, make uh, the frigid moon an even more intriguing target in the search for extraterrestrial life. Uh, and there is a mission that uh, is slated to launch next summer that could incorporate the recent findings in its investigations of Ganymede and Jupiter's other icy moons, uh, like Europa and Callisto. Uh, this uh, mission is called the Jupiter Icy Moon Explorer, uh, which NASA, of course, has uh, contracted to JUICE. NASA really loves their acronyms, but that one works out pretty well, I guess. Um, so pretty exciting. Uh, here's the actual uh, imagery. Um, so if you're a scientist uh, who knows all about uh, water on moons, then that tells you that there may be water on Ganymede. Pretty cool. All right. Uh, so here is an interesting uh, bit of news as well. This is, again, from the NASA website. NASA has awarded launch service contracts for the Europa Clipper mission uh, to SpaceX. This is pretty exciting because originally this uh, Europa mission, which is slated to launch in 2024, uh, was going to be aboard the uh, SLS, NASA's own space launch system. Um, but that project uh, has uh, been delayed. The SLS uh, project has taken a long time uh, and has gone through a lot of different uh, funding changes, um, which means that uh, it's kind of behind schedule. So NASA has said basically, sorry, SLS team, we're going to go with SpaceX's rocket, which is like already ready to go. Uh, and also, um, the SLS rocket would cost about $2 billion to send this mission to Europa. Uh, and SpaceX has given them a discount uh, and send this rocket to uh, Europa for $178 million. So that's a pretty big discount. I mean, that's a lot of money still, but compared to $2 billion, I'd take the $178 million personally. Um, so, you know, obviously, uh, we would love uh, to send uh, our own uh, rockets to space, um, uh, or NASA's rockets like the SLS. Uh, uh, you know, with the space race, the Apollo mission, uh, we, you know, when thinking about uh, the Apollo rockets, Saturn V and the space shuttle, um, uh, you can have romantic thoughts about, you know, NASA's own rockets and American ingenuity and all that. Uh, but things have kind of shifted to this private space industry. So uh, Boeing's rocket uh, is going to be testing tomorrow. And then SpaceX is already being contracted to send satellites and people to space. Um, so uh, this is this is good. And this is one positive aspect of privatized space flight, because scientists who want to send more missions to distant places like Europa uh, can do it way more easily now because it's way cheaper. So overall, it's a good thing, I would say. Now, speaking of the Europa Clipper mission, um, this is what I wanted to do a little mini deep dive on because NASA has a really great uh, Europa uh, website, which we can post in the comments. I've included the link there. Um, but uh, so this Europa Clipper mission is going to be going to uh, Europa in 2024. And Europa is one of Jupiter's moons. I've talked about Europa before. I did a live stream on my top 10 moons. And Europa, I believe, made the cut. It was close. I, I was maybe tied with Enceladus, but they're similar moons. Um, so uh, your, uh, NASA has a great website, europa.nasa.gov, that is pretty flashly, uh, flashy. And if we zoom down, uh, we can kind of go through this a little bit. So scientists are almost certain a vast ocean lies beneath Europa's icy shell. So Europa has a thick layer of water ice, and below that water ice is likely an ocean. So Europa has all the ingredients essential for life, water, chemistry, and energy. Europa is close enough to Jupiter that tidal forces keep its core active, which means the water is likely warm. Uh, and water, as we know, is, or here on Earth at least, is essential to life. So perhaps there is life on Europa. So this Europa Clipper mission is going to be exploring Europa. Uh, and uh, let's take a look at Europa in depth. So this website has a really cool interactive uh, where we can move around Europa. By the way, the surface features of Europa are named after uh, Celtic uh, mythology stories. So that's pretty cool. Um, we've talked about Celtic uh, mythology on a past live stream, which I'm going to pull up here. Uh, let's see, when did I do that? That was, I believe, that was on February 22nd of this year. Um, and uh, here on this website, we can look at the interior. So there we can see the layers 
uh, its metallic core, rocky interior, which is geologically active, and then its ocean. So there we go. Um, so this Europa Clipper mission is going to be exploring Europa uh, in uh, over the next decade. Pretty exciting, and definitely check out this website. It gives a lot of amazing information about Europa, some interactives for kids as well. Um, so uh, pretty, pretty cool. So that's our little miniature deep dive for today's live stream. Uh, but again, if you want to learn more about uh, Europa and other moons, I did my top 10 moons live stream on September 14th of last year. And then we did a live stream all about Jupiter on uh, uh, June 29th of last year. Woo, that was a long time ago. Um, so uh, pretty, uh, pretty cool stuff. Don't forget uh, youtube.com slash kcplanetarian for all of our past live streams. Um, Eric says, excuse me, beautiful evening for the stars in Kansas City. Uh, fingers crossed, I haven't looked outside in a minute, so hopefully the clouds have cleared up. Mm. And Casey says, I've seen that movie. We are supposed to stay away from Europa. There is a movie called The Europa Report. I've not watched it yet, though, Casey, um, but I hear it's good, so maybe I'll have to bump it up on my list. Um, but I do know the that, uh, yes, that there is some uh, admonitions about exploring Europa from that movie. All right, uh, let's continue on with the news. Uh, we're going to be wrapping up news here in a minute and going to our star tour. Um, but here's another very sciencey paper uh, I like pulling up just to prove that you know I'm a I'm a educated guy who uh, can find primary sources. Um, but I'll summarize for you. So astronomers have confirmed uh, the discovery of a moon-forming disk around a young exoplanet. Um, so this is pretty pretty cool stuff. Uh, there are some graphics here of the imagery. So essentially, we're looking at this exoplanet. Uh, well, we're looking at this uh, this uh, star system uh, that's far away from us, uh, about uh, do do do. Uh, oh, I didn't write down how far away it is from. Uh, oh no, I did. There we go. Uh, it is. 370 light years away from us, which is pretty close, relatively speaking. Um, so what we're seeing here is a protoplanetary disk. So this star has just formed. And there's a lot of uh, accretion material around that star in a disk that is forming planets. And essentially, astronomers have poured over data, and they've looked closely and found that one of the planets that's forming is also forming a moon. So we've actually, this is the first time we've seen an exoplanet with a moon. And here is a cool little animation. I'll start it over. Uh, that shows sort of an artist concept of what this system may look like the moon forming with the its own accretion or sorry the planet forming with its own accretion disk and the moon so there's the moon forming right there uh, and then all of that forming around this young star uh, so pretty cool stuff we've just seen an exo moon this is the first time we've found evidence of an exo moon very very cool uh, another cool far out discovery uh, in physics is that for the first time, physicists, astrophysicists have detected light coming from the far side of a black hole. Now this uh, confirms that Einstein was right, gravity can bend light, but we've had this confirmation for actually over a century. Uh, back in the early 1900s, I think 1919 in fact, there was a total solar eclipse where the moon passed in front of the sun. And during that eclipse, astronomers looked at stars next to the sun and found that they were slightly out of place. So the sun was massive enough to actually bend the starlight around it. But uh, we uh, have been theorized that black holes, since they're even more massive than stars, could definitely bend light. But this is the first time we've actually detected uh, the bent light from around a black hole. And this is not going to show us any of the science graphics here. Um, but um, basically, astronomers detected uh, X-rays that had orbited the black hole have shot, uh, shot backwards on themselves, appearing as sort of a light echo. Um, so pretty neat. Also neat that this black hole is about 800 million light years away from Earth. Um, pretty crazy. Kind of reminds me of the black hole we took pictures of last year that was in a different galaxy altogether. Uh, and, oh, cool. That uh, does it for my space news update. Awesome. We're going to check over in the comment section and then we're going to start our, uh, our star tour update. Um, let me get that loading while I'm reading the comments. Don't forget this is a live stream, so if you're tuning in, uh, please let us know where you're watching from and ask any questions you might have. David says, that is interesting that the moon's features are named off of Celtic mythology, but the moon itself is named after Greek mythology. Uh, yeah, indeed, uh, indeed, David. Um, you know, that's just mostly due to the fact that uh, Europa was discovered uh, quite a long time ago, and uh, back when Europa was discovered, along with the other planets, we were just kind of stuck in a rut of naming... Um, uh, of naming 
uh, things off of Greek mythology. But then as we've learned more about uh, these distant objects, found more moons, and then started naming features on them, we started changing uh, the uh, the naming uh, conventions. Uh, in fact, uh, Pluto, this is kind of fun, but uh, the uh, surface features of Pluto are uh, named after... Oh, I knew I wrote this down in my notes. Um, but uh, I believe the surface features of Pluto are named after various, like, uh, uh, hellish regions in mythology, essentially. Um, that kind of makes sense. Or uh, different, I, I, also, I think different monsters in mythology as well. Um, yeah, can't find my notes on that, but I'm pretty sure I'm remembering correctly on that. Uh, but that's a great point, David. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Um, and Natasha says, what do you do and what do you do uh, for, what did I do for college and training? Uh, thanks for asking that, Natasha, and thanks for watching as well. Um, so, uh, I'm the planetarium manager, uh, Patrick Hess at Union Station, uh, and I manage the programs and hardware at the planetarium. Uh, so I'm responsible for writing star tours, upgrading the projectors, and uh, doing these live streams. Uh, so, uh, I've been an amateur astronomer for most of my life, just with a, uh, having a fascination of astronomy, uh, and... Uh, just uh, messing with telescopes. Uh, and then in, in uh, around college, I started working in informal education, which is essentially museums. Um, so museums are places you go to learn outside of a classroom. That's what informal education is. Uh, and then after college, I uh, ended up finding this job that sort of combined my love of astronomy with my experience in informal education, as well as my love of technology as well. Um, so that's kind of my background. Uh, so um uh, it's all about uh, what your passions are and uh, more than anything, uh, just that you care about sharing no knowledge and science with people. Many of my coworkers come from a variety of backgrounds, uh, from theater to science to teaching, all sorts of different things. Uh, Casey says, that was actually a reference to 2010, uh, oh, A Space Odyssey. Oh, I've not seen or read that uh, one. I've only seen the original 2001 A Space Odyssey. Um, uh, but uh, interesting that both that and the movie The Europa Report um, warned us not to explore Europa. Uh, David says, are there any features in space named after American mythology, uh, Hollywood comics, etc.? Um, off the top of my head, um, I'm not sure. Uh, I believe there are some Pluto surface features uh, that are named after... Let's see. I'm just pulling up. Uh, uh, I don't think so. I, you know, I don't think we've quite quite gotten into pop culture yet in terms of naming things, just because the International Astronomical Union is, quite frankly, a bunch of old white dudes. Um, so, uh, off the top of my head, I don't know. But the other way around, uh, you know, there, uh, Harry Potter is a great example of something heavily inspired by astronomy. Um, many of the names and spells in the Harry Potter world are relating to astronomy, stars and constellations. I did a whole live stream about Harry Potter astronomy all the way back uh, in June, last year, June 3rd. So you can go to youtube.com slash KC Planetary to check that out. But that's a good question, David. I'm gonna have to do a little more research. Maybe we'll talk about that on our next stream. And Didi is uh, tuning in as well. Thanks for watching. Didi says watching from the plaza. Thank you all so much for commenting and watching. I appreciate you. And we are going to uh, lead into our final segment, which is our what's up star tour so um, we are going to be in our uh, virtual planetarium software stellarium uh, where we will be uh, taking a tour of our night sky we're starting here in front of the liberty memorial where i will be in just a few hours setting up my telescope to look at saturn tonight tonight is the opposition of saturn where saturn will be closest in its orbit to us um, but we can look out over to union station as well and the planetarium poking up here that weird uh, six-sided pyramid so again this is stellarium uh, and we are going to be doing a star tour. But you know what? Let's spice things up a little bit. Let's see if my assistant Phoebe wants to come out and join us. Uh, yeah. She's been so good. Right. Let's see how long she lasts. Oh, Phoebe, you want to teach them your new trick? Give me kisses. Oh, thank you. Yep, she's a genius all right oh she knows it too all right phoebe let's see how long this lasts um so we are going to be checking out our night sky but something actually i wanted to bring up uh before is something that will be on our night sky in about 10 years so there was a comet that was just discovered comet um bernardinelli bernstein as it is now known oops uh it won't make its closest approach to the sun uh, for another 10 years but the object is already showing signs of life 
uh, as uh, this image shows. So we can already see it. This comet has the potential to be the large, one of the largest comets ever discovered. It's uh, estimated to be between uh, 62 to 230 miles long, and it could be up to... <laughs> did you just poop on me? You did. Nicely done, Phoebe. Right on cue. Uh, it could be... <laughs> um, uh, ugh, could be three times the size of the current nuclear folder. Oh my goodness. Phoebe's going crazy right now. What are you doing, bird? Oh my goodness. Do you see yourself? Is that what you're doing? Anyway. Oh yes, thank you. Uh, so this comet, uh, like I said, isn't going to pass by here for another 10 years, but it's already starting to be active, forming its tail, so it's sure to be a spectacular sight. All right, so, uh, but let's check out our night sky view. So this is our current view of the daytime sky. So we are going to fast forward time a little he here uh, to sunset. Uh, the sun will be setting pretty late, although the days are getting shorter already, unfortunately. All right, yeah, thank you. Okay, so as the sun sets tonight, you'll see a couple interesting objects. And although our view is pretty spectacular here, I am going to change our view to a bit of a flatter landscape just to give us a nice view of the horizon. Um, and uh, you'll see a very bright point of light setting in the night sky tonight. In fact, you'll see it in the daytime sky before the sun finishes setting. And you'll notice that this bright point of light does not twinkle, unlike the stars around it. Uh, this is a planet, and it is our evening star, uh, the planet Venus. So, of course, Venus is not a star, um, but it is very, very bright right now, shining brightly in our western horizon. So you'll see this uh, setting here. Uh, for about 200 or so days, Venus is visible in our night sky, and then it goes behind the sun, and then it becomes visible in our, our early morning sky. Um, so And then it's called the morning star. But you can just now see it as it is setting. Uh, but we're going to fast forward a little bit later so the stars come out. Wow, Phoebe. What are you doing back there, girl? Oh, my goodness. Ah, uh, yes, I know. All right. And, oh, yeah, I can just you want to fly up there. No, we're not going to let you do that. Ah, oh, I know. Okay. All right. So, <laughs> this is very distracted. This is not great for the stream. Um, all right. Okay. Okay. We all done. We're done. Okay. Everybody say bye to Phoebe. Not happening today. That's okay. We'll get her out when she's a little more chill. Uh, so, uh, let's start in our northern sky. Uh, there are a couple patterns that are familiar all season, or all year long, rather. And that is the Big and Little Dipper. We've got the Big Dipper right here. Looks like a big spoon in our northern sky. And then the Little Dipper next to it, sort of backwards, same sort of configuration. Um, of course, these uh, two patterns are well-known around the world, although they are not official constellations. Uh, the official constellations are Ursa Major and Ursa Minor. It's a great time of year to look at Ursa Major, the big bear. The tail of the bear is the handle of the spoon here. And the body of the bear contains these six stars and its head over here with its legs extending downwards. Um, so we can... Remember, oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm forgetting what the hotkeys are. Nope, that's not it. Ah, there it is. All right. Oh, it's not only showing one of them. There we go. All right. <laughs> Woo! Okay, so there's the big and little bear. Um. <laughs> oh, geez. All right, I'm just looking at the comments now. Um, well, Carl's asking, what type of telescope will you be using tonight? I'll be using a reflecting telescope with a six inch aperture. Uh, so we should get some nice views. Uh, David says, how is Science City using VR? Uh, is there a Science City VR experience? I've not seen this before. Um, ooh, ah, I'm not sure we've made a VR experience for Science City yet. Um, but uh, that would be cool if we did. I did a live stream in VR, by the way, where we did a ride along for the Apollo mission uh, on March 8th of this year. So that was a fun one. <laughs> DD says uh, the IAU needs to ask Neil deGrasse Tyson if he'll join. Um, I think Neil's a little bit busy. <laughs> um, 
tweeting. Uh, Brian says, hi, Brian. Thanks for watching tonight. Brian says, unidentified flying Phoebe and Venus. Love you. Love your show. Tuned in from KCK. Love you too, Brian and the rest of the family. Say hi to everybody for me. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, Natasha says, Phoebe. Uh, and Phoebe is uh, pouting in her cage. Um, Casey says, a pooper reel. Yeah, we do need a, a blooper pooper reel for this stream, don't we? All right, so anyway, back to this uh, this nonsense, looking at our night sky. Um, so let's uh, move on. Uh, let's check out our western sky, see what's setting this season. Uh, and we have Virgo the Maiden, which is just about to be out of sight this season. Uh, Virgo looks like a big stick figure, so here's Virgo's head. Uh, here are her arms, here's her torso, and her legs. Uh, now the star pattern here is going to be a little bit different. Oop, let's clear things out. Um, oh, it's insisting I'm putting them all up. That's all right. So there's Virgo. Virgo represents a goddess of fertility or harvest. The Greeks called her Demeter. The Romans called her Ceres. In art, she's often depicted as carrying an ear of grain in one hand, and this star in her hand is named Spica. Spica means ear of grain in Latin. Now, above Spica and Virgo, we'll find a little ice cream cone-shaped constellation, uh, which is called Buotis. Uh, this is one of the oldest constellations in the night sky. It was said to be a hunter or a shepherd. Uh, it was also said to be watching the Ursa bears. Uh, the star, the brightest star in Buotis is named Arcturus, which means watcher of the bear in ancient Greek. I should put the labels on as well. Um, now, I wanted to point out these two constellations because there is a nifty trick you can use to remember the stars Arcturus and Spica. Um, all you have to do is start at the handle of the Big Dipper here and draw an imaginary line through the Big Dipper's handle across the sky, and it will arc through these two stars. And then there's a little saying to help you remember. Just remember, arc to Arcturus and speed on to Spica. Again, from the Big Dipper's handle, just arc to Arcturus and speed on to Spica, and you can easily find and remember those two stars. <laughs> Natasha says, Phoebe is my spirit animal. She's chaotic. I love it. Uh, well, I... I hope that uh, you don't fly over to people and poop on their shoulders randomly, but uh, sometimes the chaos is fun, Natasha, uh, and she's pretty great. I think she's a little tired. I'll get her out at the very end just for her to say goodbye to everybody. How's that sound? All right, so let's move on over, uh, and let's see. Uh, you know what? No, we're going to go over to the south here. Uh, now, the summer sky is one of my favorites, which is kind of a bummer that we're not having a star tour in the planetarium right now. Because in the summertime, you can see the Milky Way galaxy really clearly in the early evening. Um, so uh, the Milky Way stretches around us, so you can see it every season, really. But since our solar system is located two-thirds of the way from the center of our galaxy to the edge, uh, it's much brighter in one direction. And in the summertime, we face towards the center of our galaxy, uh, which is why it's easier to see in the summertime, because we can see the brighter part right now. Now, if you're having trouble finding the Milky Way, there's a little asterism you can use to help you. It's called the teapot. It's right over here. Here's the teapot's handle. Here's its lid and its spout. Now, this teapot uh, is part of a constellation called Sagittarius, the centaur. But if you follow the pointy spout of this teapot, it'll point towards the galactic core, uh, which is uh, the brightest part there. Uh, next to Sagittarius is Scorpius. Now, this is an easy constellation to spot. It's fairly bright. Just look for this fan of four stars coming out of this red one. Here are the scorpion's claws. And its body and tail curve downwards like a big hook. Um, so there it is. Now, Scorpius uh, was a monster that was said uh, to be chasing the hunter Orion. Orion, another famous constellation. It's a winter constellation, so it's not up right now. Um, it's said that when Orion boasted too much about himself, that the gods sent down this giant scorpion to chase him. Uh, and the two constellations chase each other to this day as they've never quite caught up to one another. Uh, by the way, fun fact about Scorpius, that bright red star at the heart of Scorpius is named uh, Antares, which literally means not Mars in uh, ancient Greek. And that's because ancient people sometimes accidentally thought that it was Mars. And so they named it not Mars, so they would remember it's not Mars. Um, all right, moving on over to this bright triangle we can see up high in our summer skies. This triangle can be seen high overhead during our summer months, and as you can probably imagine, astronomers were very clever and original when it came to naming this triangle, famous for our summer skies. They called it the Summer Triangle. Uh, now, these three stars are part of three separate constellations. Uh, we will start with this one here. This star is Deneb, which means tail in Arabic, 
It's part of Cygnus the Swan. This swan looks like a big cross. So here's the swan's neck. Here's its wings and here's its tail. Now Cygnus represents uh, a disguise that Zeus, the king of the Greek gods, used to take when he came down to Earth to, uh, let's just say, socialize with humanity. He often disguised himself as this swan. And we have Altair, which is part of Aquila the Eagle. Aquila was one of Zeus's pets in charge of carrying things around for him like his lightning bolts. And then we also have this star here, Vega, which is uh, one of the brightest stars in our night sky, the fifth brightest overall. It's near a tiny little diamond in the sky called Lyra the Harp. This harp belonged to Orpheus, a famous poet and prophet. Now there's a cool deep space object inside the harp of Lyra that is one of my favorite deep space objects, so we are going to zoom in on it. It's right here between these two stars. And I'm going to have to pause time here so it doesn't move. But this is the Ring Nebula. The Ring Nebula is a giant cloud of gas and dust that contains the remnants of a dead star. Um, so when stars die, uh, they uh, will die in a couple different ways. Sometimes they'll explode into supernovas or collapse to form black holes. But those events are actually very rare, even though they're much more famous in science fiction. Um, uh, what usually happens to a star, a smaller, more average-sized star, that is, uh, is as they get older, they uh, will finish fusing all of the hydrogen at their core into helium. Uh, but because they aren't heavy enough to fuse heavier elements than helium uh, or carbon and oxygen, they will spread their layers out into space, leaving behind these beautiful nebulas. Now, here is a, a closer picture of the, or a more detailed picture of the ring nebula there. Um, so these different colors are different types of gas that were once part of that star. The red color is ionized hydrogen from the outer layers of that star. The blue color is helium. And there are, other he there are other heavier elements like carbon and oxygen mixed in as well. And then at the center is what we call a white dwarf, which is the core of the dead star, a very hot but totally inert ball of gas. That's all that remains of the star. And this is the fate of our sun. In about four billion years, our star will finish fusing all of its hydrogen into helium and it will no longer be able to contain its mass. So it will expand and it will fill our solar system with a beautiful nebula, much like the Ring Nebula. Oh, and by the way, it'll also devour planet Earth, so something to look forward to. <laughs> so there is the Ring Nebula. Ooh, too zoomed out. All right, and that are those are kind of the highlights. Um, one other thing I wanted to point out is that the Perseid meteor shower is coming up. Uh, it peaks on August 12th, but over the next month it will be uh, you'll be able to see it. But again, next Thursday will be the peak. And the Perseid is one of the best meteor showers of the year. You can see over 100 meteors per hour at its peak. Uh, and meteor showers are named after the constellations that they emanate from. So this will be coming from the constellation Perseus, which we'll have to fast forward a little bit to see. Uh, uh, it'll be rising around midnight uh, next week. Uh, but whoo, it's too far. Um, so oh, there we go. There's Perseus here. Perseus kind of looks like a... A big starfish. Um, there's the constellation. Again, I don't know what they're doing with these lines, but um, you can kind of imagine the starfish there. That's how I remember it, at least. Uh, so Perseus there will be where the Perseid meteor shower is coming from. Um, in fact, if I turn the stars on there, you can see uh, where they emanate from. Uh, so meteor showers happen when the Earth passes through known clouds of interstellar, not interstellar, uh, solar system dust and debris. Uh, many of these meteor showers, uh, or this debris, was left over um, from uh, passing comets um, and the Perseid meteor shower. Uh, let's see where its material came from. Um, um, ooh, unknown. I'm not sure where uh, this this particular. Oh no, it's associated with the comet uh, Swift Tuttle. Um, so uh, this is a periodic comet that last passed by in 1995. Uh, it has a period of 133 years, so it'll be a little while before it comes back. Uh, but its dust uh, trail and debris uh, causes the Perseid meteor shower. Um, and uh, there ooh, there was one right there. Amazing. Um, so uh, they will be uh, pretty spectacular. In fact, I wonder if I uh, adjust the clock here uh, to the 12th, if it will uh, show... Uh, the meteors coming from the Perseids. But uh, anyway, uh, so that'll be pretty spectacular. You'll want to get far away from light pollution uh, if you can. Uh, and if you're curious about where to go for stargazing, just look up a light pollution map. Um, I just did a, a quick search for one uh, on my favorite web browser and 
Look at that. There is a light pollution map of the Kansas City area. So you can use this to find some good spots. There's a spot near Eureka, Kansas that I often go to down here. That's pretty good within less than two mile, or two uh, hours of downtown Kansas City. Um, so uh, check that out again next Thursday. The Perseid meteor shower is peaking. Uh, and uh, that will be... Uh, yeah, that will be our uh, What's Up Star Tour, everyone. Uh, Natasha says, watching from Leavenworth. Thank you so much for watching, Natasha, and for all your comments. I appreciate you, and I appreciate everybody else who's tuned in tonight. Hope you enjoyed this stream. We covered a lot of astronomy news updates. We did a miniature deep dive into Europa uh, and the exploration of life there. Uh, and we uh, did a little star tour looking at what we can see over the next month in our night skies. Um, a couple other last minute housekeeping things. And if you have any last second questions or comments, be sure to put those in the comment section now. Um, but uh, as a reminder, tonight in a, about an hour and a half, I'll be setting up my telescope over at the Liberty Memorial. And we'll be looking at Saturn tonight because it is the opposition of Saturn, uh, where Saturn is closest in its orbit. It's the best night uh, to view the ringed planet. And we'll see some other objects as well. Again, that is at the Liberty Memorial at the World War I Museum across the street from Union Station. I'll be setting up on the observation deck there. Uh, David's asking when our next live stream is, and it will be on the first Monday of next month, which will be the 6th of September. So tune in then that Monday night where we'll be uh, checking all the space news and uh, things like that. Uh, and uh, and uh, maybe uh, David will have finished uh, the uh, book by then, and maybe we'll do a little mini deep dive into the three-body problem and the sequels. That could be fun. Um, so don't forget, uh, our laser shows are going on right now every day. We have a, a bunch of educational astronomy laser shows as well as a musical symphony, Peter and the Wolf, and our fan favorites, The Beatles, Michael Jackson, um, Daft Punk, and Queen happening uh, every day of the week. Um, check out our schedule at unionstation.org or go to facebook.com slash Planetarium and subscribe to us there. As a reminder, all of the Union Station attractions are following the mayor of Kansas City's new mask ordinance. So if you visit, uh, you must wear a face covering over your nose and mouth, regardless of vaccination, vaccination status. Again, that is due to the mayor's order. We have no control over that. And we thank you for complying uh, with those orders. Uh, and uh, don't forget, this weekend, Friday and Saturday, is a Laser Girl Power, where we're having our Girl Power mixtape, uh, a bunch of awesome music tracks um, all about Girl Power. And then we're doing a Laser, Lady Gaga, Lizzo, and Beyonce those nights as well. Friday and Saturday nights, starting at 6 p.m., going through 10 p.m. Tickets available now. Uh, and uh, yeah, so uh, Natasha says... Uh, when, when will it devour Earth? I'm scared. When will the ring nebula, or sorry, when will the uh, the sun, when it turns into a nebula? Uh, about four billion years from now. Uh, so I don't know about you, but I've got other places to be in four billion years, so I'm not super concerned about that. we got plenty of time, Natasha. Don't worry. Casey says, missed the weekly streams, but love to see you still sharing your knowledge with us. Well, Casey, I appreciate that you missed those. Um, and, uh, you know, we're going to keep these going monthly for now, but who knows what will happen in the future. Uh, but uh, I encourage you, if you're able to uh, come visit us at the Planetarium in person, especially when our Star Tours come back because you'll get that same feeling of uh, our live streams but in person in the 3d world of the planetarium uh, and then sarah says thank you see you later tonight awesome sarah so excited to see you out uh, for some stargazing all right everyone well thank you so much for watching thanks again to our supporting sponsor mri global for keeping the live streams and many other programs at union station going uh thank you to all of our longtime watchers uh to our uh, union station members don't forget if you subscribe to a membership to union station you get free admission to the science center free passes to the planetarium and discount tickets to our exhibitions like the auschwitz exhibition that's another reminder i should make auschwitz tickets are sold out for weeks and weeks so Buy your tickets now if you want to see it before the end of the year because there are only spots available um, in uh, future months. I believe weekends aren't available till something like October. So buy your tickets in advance and be sure to check all the guidelines for what you can and can't bring to that exhibition. Uh, I have been your planetary manager, Patrick Hess. I will see you later tonight at 8.30 at the Liberty Memorial for our stargazing. Uh, and uh, Eric, one more question. When will the new projectors be installed? Our new projectors will be installed at the beginning of September. Science City and the Planetarium close for two weeks every year in September for regular maintenance and training. And that's when we're going to be installing the projectors. So there won't be any uh, interruption in our regular service. And Casey says, I brought the whole family a couple months ago and they loved it. My kids can't stop talking about it. See you soon, Casey. That warms my heart to hear. I really appreciate it. And I hope to see you all again. I uh, hope to see you and the family at the planetarium uh, or any anywhere else uh, and uh, maybe stargazing tonight, but if not, definitely another time. All right, we're going to wrap things up right before we hit the one hour mark. Thank you again so much for watching. I'll see you later tonight or next month. Have a great evening, everybody. Bye-bye.